Hello and welcome to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green and I'm the founder and initiator of the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. Uh, and this is one of many uh, upcoming classes, lectures, um, and collaborations that I'll be doing uh, with various folks. Uh, so we're at the beginning stages of the Center. Uh, and this class is going to be called Homer and the Critique of Western Civilization. We'll be doing these lectures from June to August of 2022. And the main books that we're going to be covering are uh, Homer's Odyssey, uh, the Robert Fagel's translation, and uh, Chigosi Obiyama's book, An Orchestra of Minorities, which is in part a rewriting um, or retelling of uh, Homer's Odyssey. So it's a, a, a Obiyama is a Nigerian author, uh, and uh, he's one of many uh, different writers that we could look at that uh, has dealt with themes from Homer. Um, uh, there will be other writers, thinkers, authors that I will discuss throughout the course. Um, particularly related to critical theory. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, Theodore Adorno um, and Max Hor Horkheimer, uh, one of their books, for example, uh, is called Dialectic of Enlightenment. It came out in the mid-1940s, and they deal with the character of Odysseus from Homer's Odyssey in their book as well. And more broadly, I think that we could think about a critique of Western civilization and this idea that the arts and literature and culture is in some way in the West oriented around the Greeks, uh, which is an old notion. It goes back especially to the European Renaissance. Uh, but it's still with us today, so I, I still train students at the university level um, who take my myth and literature class, for example, and will become high school teachers. And one of the impulses in our class is to always teach the Odyssey so that our university students have that under their belt when they go out and have to teach it to high schoolers. So there's a lot of ways that Homer remains compulsive in curriculum, at least in the United States. And um, that might be something that I want to critique as well. Uh, but also not to critique without knowing, you know, some things about Homer. So we will do a close reading of Homer with the idea and the questions in mind of, about Homer's relevance to 2022 and the ways that he, he, among other authors, Shakespeare, for example, often get used in compulsory curriculum, as I will call it, um, in ways that, I mean, then there's no way that Homer could have, uh, uh, if there is one Homer, right, <laughs> to begin with, if, there's no way that, that that person can anticipate the way that uh, their work is going to be used. Like Shakespeare, as I say in my Shakespeare lectures, didn't really seem to care about, you know, his plays being in print, let alone that people will be reading them and studying them rigorously hundreds of years later and then having all high school students read some sort of Shakespeare play or Romeo and Juliet as um, frequently taught in high school. Um, so I want to separate out the cultural uses, the makers of culture, the makers of school curriculum, and the rationales that they use to study something like Homer's Odyssey or the Iliad uh, for centuries, um, and the cultural production that makes works like Chigozier on Obiama's book, uh, Orchestra of Minorities, uh, um, sellable, for example, um, uh, in, in a mass scale. Um, so that is a, a, you know, winning the Booker pr Prize, for example, as the cover here says. Uh, so my lectures will be online. If there's enough of a contingent of people who take the classes, then I'll organize some in-person Zoom classes that we can do real time just so that, you know, I can interact with you all 
uh, real time and address questions or just have a conversation and so that you can hear from each other. Uh, if not, I'll just keep making these videos and putting them out onto YouTube. Uh, uh, I do ask if you're able to, um, uh, you can support me and the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory on Patreon. You can do it, I mean, uh, as a one-time donation of $50 for this class, um, or you can do it in installments. I mean, you can do it um, just like anything, a dollar or more, and you can um, keep sub, uh, contributing to Patreon. Um, uh, if, if you don't want it to be contributing for month after month because you're watching your budget, then I suggest a $50 donation. Um, but you don't have to. It's just it's a suggested donation. Um, uh, I, I do would like people to follow me on Patreon and contribute if you can, um, since I'm trying to do this for a living. Uh, okay, I'm going to pull this off of the, the screen share here and get started um, with my... Uh, intro lecture. So let's just jump in and I'll say a few things about the cultural context um, off and on throughout these lectures, thinking about that overarching question of um, how do we read Homer from a critique of Western civilization, from a critique of uh, Eurocentrism and the way that that has inflected versions of the so-called West as we use the term uh, in colloquial speak. Sometimes I will use the term Euro-Christian as well, and maybe some of you have heard me talk about that terminology in other lectures. Uh, but if we jump into uh, Homer here, let, let's just begin with some, some background stuff. Uh, most people watching this will already know that um, Homer is an ancient Greek author. We don't really know completely if it's one person, but there's enough stylistic uh, um, integrity between the books, the Odyssey and uh, the Iliad, both 24 books long, uh, that capture the style of Greek epic. And so we have uh, an author who we call Homer. Uh, and I will just approach just for because it's easier to speak this way uh, as as Homer being um, one author um, I will as literature classes like early literature classes often teach um, stre and stress there's a oftentimes a difference between the author who who writes the book and the narrator or the person speaking in the book but because there's such a oral element to this early literature and because the author is kind of a fictional conglomeration of ideas to begin with i'll often re times refer to the narrator in this book as also being homer um, and you might see a little bit more of a distinction between the narrative work that i do with obiana when we get to him in the second half of course than i do than my treatment of homer um so to begin, what makes Homer especially important, I think, is the place that he's held in the European imaginary since the late Renaissance humanism. And for this course, and in general, I'm going to see the United States as positioning its own self in the European or Western European trajectory of political thought especially and philosophical thought so while we might critique at times uh, some of the ways that the West exists or I might bring up maybe indigenous American or Native American perspectives something like that I'm um, in general even though I'm working in the United States I'm working out of Denver Colorado I will um, include the United States in what I call the European imaginary, sometimes called the Euro-Christian imaginary. Uh, and it's, uh, so Homer's had an important place since um, late Renaissance humanism. Uh, and so this is, of course, the term Renaissance means rebirth, right? Uh, it is a time in Europe where Europe is, Europeans are looking back to the classics. They're looking back particularly to ancient authors 
that um, or works that exist before Christ, so before Christianity um, uh, becomes a major religion. And so there's a lot of self-reflection going on in the European mind, if I could call it that, and dealing with um, ancient authors as well. Uh, there's a lot of critique of, for example, in the late Renaissance, there's a lot of critique of the hold of the Catholic Church in the European uh, uh, context. And so, of course, we have the Protestant Reformation uh, in the early 15 teens, right, right, or late 15 teens, sorry, like 1517. Uh, is, is a frequent date that's given for Luther and the nailing of the 95 Theses. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, turmoil that goes on politically uh, speaking in Europe during uh, the late Renaissance. Um, and, and that's important because I think um, we still in many ways in our curriculum uh, for schools and the, particularly with Homer, um, Homer has been embedded within the self critiques that are going on in European civilization uh, during the during the late Renaissance that might be different than say the 20th and 21st century critiques of European civilization that we might have or post-colonial critiques that might erupt as well throughout our discussions. Um, so Homer has been central. Homer's been something that's school children grow up on uh, for generations and so the just the reception alone to Homer over many centuries becomes something that we can talk about. From a critical theory perspective we use literature, I am using literature in these courses um, uh, with a particular aim. So I want to talk for a second here about my concept of liter literature and what it is. So I'm using a dyna dynamic concept of the literary as a way to track social desire over time. This alone is going to make our approach radically different from most courses on say myth and literature or just on Homer's Odyssey, like a celebration of it. So this is the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. And what I'm working with here is the idea that literature is not necessarily high art. It's not necessarily the self-conscious writing that presents itself as art, or lots of different definitions that we could use for literature. Um, the literary and culture, as I will frame it for these lectures, is a way that we look at cultural expression, what Stephen Greenblatt calls cultural poetics. Sometimes people call it new historicism. So we look at the cultural context and then we look at the rhetorical motivations that accompany people expressing something in a cultural context. So that's what I mean by social desire over time. It's not just that one person or one even small group of people really loved Homer over time. Uh, uh, it was, it was uh, considered tradition to read Homer over time. And what, what does tradition do and build up? And why do we maintain a, some sort of an adherence to that tradition? What motivates us to keep reading Homer, for example, and to have discussions about a critique of Western civilization. So uh, the critical theory perspective takes the idea of literature as a subject matter, but the, so we could look at different things, uh, different types of writing as literature. So in the Renaissance, for example, fictional novels were not considered literature. Literature was very much, high literature was very much considered some sort of maybe lyric poetry. Um, uh, and maybe not even always a, a whole bunch of epic poetry, right? So um, uh, Homer's Odyssey will fall into the category of epic. Um, but later on in the 19th century, for example, uh, with writers like George Eliot or with uh, Charles Dickens, for example, there's a much um, J after Jane Austen, maybe especially, I should mention her, um, the shift in what is literature um, becomes something like the modern novel, right? So the genre of what counts as literature changes over time. That's what I mean, that it's dynamic. Um, and what we do is we look at 
uh, different genres, different literary production, and we try to give a sen- get a sense of what is being expressed at the cultural level. Um, and that's what the Critical Center for Critical and Cultural Theory does. Like that's what we mean by sort of stepping it back. So we don't read books here for character identification alone. We might identify with as individuals with different characters, but the goal here of uh, studying literature is looking at something uh, more expressive at the level of culture. So oftentimes in broader culture, aesthetic concepts like literature are treated as if they're static and transcendent, or transcendent. In other words, as if they are eternal and unchanging, like capital L literature. This is what sophisticated people read and do. Uh, instead, um, we so we have this. Well, not even instead, but in 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 the tradition of the capital H humanities, for example, um, uh, which I have some problems with in the the twentieth twenty first century. Um, but there's definitely a tradition of the humanities. Um, and in that tradition, it's easy to take art for granted as just always being there. Capital A, art. Art for art's sake, right? Which some of you will know the movement from the late 19th century. Um, it may be valuable and deemed, in a sense, in, intrinsic, that like the, the, the importance of capital A, art, to our society. But such abstractness can also make that capital A version of art seem the material of museums and only of high culture. Uh, And I wanna challenge that. So our assumptions about culture, our assumptions about art are very much historically driven uh, assumptions. And that's really what the critical theory angle does to things is it brings a little bit more of a historical context um uh and and to to look to look at 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 all of of a water wider swath of what goes in to uh expressing something like culture um again i will use oftentimes stephen greenblatt's term cultural poetics instead of new historicism because i think that the term poetics captures a little bit more of the expressive and aesthetic elements than just saying that I'm bringing a sort of historical critique to it. Um, but very much the the classic critical theorists like Horkheimer and Adorno are interested in the in the uh, the interruption of aesthetic ideas with actual history, with material history. Right. So you might hear those little um, uh, echoes of of Marxian thought uh, uh, as we go on. Um, So, you know, when we do think of capital A art um, and high culture or capital L literature um, and museums, you know, there's a good reason for the reason for why we associate literature with high art. Um, So literary aesthetics continue to be used today for as they were in the beginning of the 19th century, for example, for social control. Um, the beginnings of literary programs um, and Viswanathan um, uh, I am blanking on the name. Yeah, Gowry Viswanathan uh, uh, wrote a book called Masks of Conquest. It was kind of a post-colonial book about the beginnings of uh uh, literary education um, for in English, the language of English, for example, right? Um, and the Swanathan noted that uh, literary education was something that was used in the colonies to make uh, uh, colonial subjects adhere to the aesthetics that were popular back in England and to give a sense of an orientation towards the land from which all of the colonial administration was coming. So studying Shakespeare in India, for example, um, was really about the sort of power relationship back in England. And then what you have happening in the 19th century is a wider and wider public uh, audience uh, that develops in England, a a wider public uh, um, literate public that can read and that is starting to consume 
works that would be called literature. And there had been revolutions on the continent, for example, in Europe during the 19th century, um, 1848 being one of the big ones, but also, you know, we could think about the Paris Commune. Uh, um, you could think about the, the French Revolution in the late 1700s. And the class establishment in England was very concerned about an uprising. So literature was also used in on the continent, or sorry, on the island of England, in order to um, separate a kind of middle class, uh, growing middle class from a working class, and to give um, aspirations to the middle class that might be more centered towards the values of um, the aristocracy or upper class folks. And so literature was very much used um, uh, as also also access to higher education, for example, was used as a way to stave off the kinds of uh, what Marx would have called a proletarian or working class type of revolution in the 19th century. And so schools, universities are definitely, you know, a way of thinking about social control and literature and the place of literary departments as they emerged. Um, were wrapped up in that kind of social control as they still are today if we're thinking about something like high school curriculum in the United States. Um, and because of that, literature has often, the concept of literature has uh, frequently accompanied the aspirations for people to be more sophisticated, for sort of some sort of a myth of class mobility that if I learn more or read a bunch of books, I will somehow be able to lift myself up out of my conditions. Um, and much of this can also, you know, uh, 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 exemplify the weight that comes from the humanist tradition, right? That if I learn all the arts that my education is somehow going to set me free. Um, so that becomes part of an ideology, as what, what Marx and the critical theorists will claim, um, that the ideology says that if we, are, if we become more literate, literate, more sensitive to aesthetics, that we are um, uh, somehow beginning to become more liberated, more civilized, uh, and, and uh, um, align ourselves with the ruling classes. Um, now, in the 20th century, all of that ideology gets changed, um, uh, or challenged at least, um, through various forms of literary critique. But, you know, just to take a step back here at the beginning, uh, literary aesthetics do still carry on with my students that come to university, especially because I teach at a very working class university, or have done so for the past 19 years. What I've noticed over and over again is that a lot of my working class students come to study literature in the university with the myth or the ideology of class mobility. Um, that they want to become literate, they want to become cultured, and they think that's going to get them further in life. And then later on, you know, they become like a really poorly paid teacher or something like that. And they have to find all sorts of other justifications for wanting to continue to be involved in arts and humanities. Um, uh, so I want to presence from the beginning the idea of social control because Homer has been central to so many um, educational programs and if we have, we have to think about educational programs as social control. So um, we can think again just like many high schools in the United States. My nephews for example um, uh, in high school today are still assigned the same curriculum that I was assigned in the 1990s which is a curriculum that's heavily influenced by post-World War II culture um, and uh, an explosion in humanism that developed into the National Endowments for the Humanities and the National Endowments for the Arts. Um, reading J.D. Salinger, reading The Great Gatsby, Catcher in the Rye, Maybe Brave New World, Animal Farm, Lord of the Flies, Of Mice and Men, um, uh, books that are frequently assigned to high school audiences in the United States. There might be some updating of that curriculum with more recent books, especially books that might uh, follow uh, along the lines of more DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion concerns. Um, but the fundamentals of the curriculum are still sort of there and have this humanist element. 
Um, and I'm su surprised because, you know, you know, I mean, if you're a kid in the 1960s and you're reading uh, Catcher in the Rye, maybe it's going to feel more timely than reading um, The Trials and Tribulations of Holden Caulfield in 2022, for example. And so the humanist tendency is to say, oh, no, 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 there's this capital A art, capital L literature idea, and the concept of a coming-of-age novel like To Kill a Mockingbird or uh, Holden Caulfield in uh, Catcher in the Rye is going to be able to be resonant with the teenager from 2022 um, in uh, ways that, that correspond with in some ways to a teenager reading it in the 1960s. My critical theory approach is going to push against the ideology of humanism and humanistic tendencies to make art and literature into static transcendent transcendent concepts right so that will be the way that i frame these lectures um so to identify with those values necessarily like like uh, or, uh, uh, or to identify the uh, um the values or the ideology of humanism for example is not always necessarily to disagree with the values but i ask you to, all who are watching and listening to consider what are the social ways that we use literature today in our culture we can think about it in a lot of different ways is it gendered for example how many men do you know who go to a book club how many new york times bestsellers are geared towards some version of self-help today so if we think about what is literate or literary culture today, how much of it really is fiction? How much of it is poetry? How many? How often do you see a book of poetry on the New York Times bestseller list? Um, and of course, we could ask, you know, why does selling the bestseller list? Like, what does that tell us about um, our assumptions about whether or not literature or art is effective to? Um, so we could talk about issues of consumption or consumption society, consumer society. Um, to the extent that more affluent schools um, in our uh, communities, um, especially in the sub suburbs, um, have been able to update the classic reading lists, the driving force, as with mainstream book publishing in the, in, in, in the New York industry, which is very much uh, the controlling industry still in the US, um, much of current literary production is focused and fueled by an attention to the values of inclusive excellence or diversity, ex equity, and inclusion. I imagine that most of my uh, viewers will have a sense that the language around race, language around gender, um, uh, more so probably than class, um, are going to be driving a lot of the concerns of literary production in the at least in the united states today um, following closely behind that might be issues of ability and disability um, uh, sexuality sexual orientation gender expression uh, um, and just gender in general um, so gender expressivity um, uh, spectrum-based gender issues so transgender issues uh, um, intersex issues um, uh, might be driving uh, uh, gen issues of gender fluidity, for example, as opposed to a static kind of sexual orientation um, might be driving things. So th those identity categories, which are identified by ideological driving forces like the American Association for Colleges and Universities, um, will advance those identity um, categories and those identity attention to them drives literary production and drives educational production in the United States. To point that out necessarily is well is not necessarily to disagree with some of the agenda, but it is to look at where power is and how power disseminates into the kinds of discourse that we speak. Um, and so, if we're going to think about that in conjunction with a critical theory approach to something like Homer's Odyssey or Obiama's An Orchestra of Mi Minorities, um, we need to think in 
critically about what drives literary production today as well, because that will drive the concerns of us as readers. Um, it'll just drive the concerns of those who want to continue to take this class and ha um, uh, engage with my lectures. Um, it'll definitely decide for some people who won't take this class because they'll say like, well, Roger isn't being diverse enough. Why are we even talking about Homer's Odyssey today? Um, uh, isn't this just a reorientation towards Eurocentric culture? Um, all of those types of questions that um, will be floating around a class like this. Uh, so uh, I want us to just, just be attentive from lecture one here um, in terms of, of what are the motivating forces just to have an active, ongoing, inquisitive relationship about what the motivations are or the motivating forces are behind literary production and our assumptions about literary aesthetics. Again, my approach is to say that literary aesthetics or the concept of the literary is not something we should throw out because it's historically a classist idea, for example, but that the way I will approach the concept of the literary is that it is a way to track social desire over time. For more than 500 years, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey have widely been read as foundational to Western civilization, closely related and especially important in Anglophone or English speaking culture has been Virgil's Aeneid. Hero worship was often used to hold young boys interests as they learned Latin and Greek. Traditional education drew on British histories inflected by Virgil's Aeneid that had been imagined since Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 11th century when he connected Arthurian legends to the survivors of the Trojan War. It's important to see then how deeply enmeshed English literature is to the imagination of the Trojan War. For example, Drawing on Geoffrey of Monmouth's 1136 History of the Kings of Britain, the anonymous poet of the, the poem uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which was written around the year 1300, we'll say, he writes this. So these are actually the opening lines of a translation from Middle English to Modern English of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. It opens like this. Soon as the siege and assault had ceased at Troy, the burg broken and burnt to brands and ashes, the traitor who trammels the tr of treason there wrought was tried for his treachery, the foulest on earth. It was Aeneas, the noble and his, kin, and his high kin, who then subdued provinces, lords, they became well nigh of all the wealth in the Western Isles. Fourth rich Romulus to Rome rapidly came with great business that burg he builds set up first and names it with his name. And now it has Titius to Tuscany and townships begin Longaboard in Lombardy lifts up homes and fared over the French flood Felix Brutus. On many banks, all broad Britain, he settles then, where war and wreck and wonder betimes have worked within, and oft both bliss and blunder have held sway swiftly since. That's stanza one. I'm gonna read stanza two of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and then say some things about this. And when this Britain was built by this barren rich, bold men were bred therein of battle beloved in many a troubled time turmoil that wrought. More flames on this fold have fallen here oft than any other I know of since that time. But of all that here built, of Britain the kings, ever was Arthur highest, as I have heard tell. And so of earnest adventure, I aim to show the astonishes sight 
as some men do hold it, and an outstanding action of Arthur's wonders. If you will list to this lay but one little while, I'll tell it straight as I in town heard it, with tongue as was said and spoken in story, staunch and strong, with linked letters loaded as in this land so long. So the poet who's from up the up north in England, he's not from London, this uh, um, poet of, of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, um, is drawing on um, Geoffrey of Monmouth's history of the Kings of Britain, which first connected this. But, but what is essential here to look to, at when we're thinking about Homer is the way that the Western literary mind, if you call it that, is really invested in tracing a kind of intellectual lineage back to Troy and not just to the Greeks, right? Not just to Menelaus and Agamemnon and those, the, the, the folks who um, go and um, uh, uh, destroy Troy, um, but the Trojans themselves who then leave from the shambles of Troy and move in to settle what becomes Western civilization with Rome, with Lombardy, and with England, with Brutus, and then Arthur. So um, that's what I want to think about when we read these texts for this class this summer, is looking at the social imaginary and how that desire is tracked over time. So we need to be highly attentive to the ways that people use reading and literature to form their own national fantasies. Now the nation state maybe doesn't exist in its modern form around the year 1300 when the poet is writing Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but what we see emerging are sort of nationalist fantasies, right? Homer's persistent presence then remains important to understanding social desire. So let's turn to the work now, but let me just re-hit that one more time, that the reason why we're doing Homer and the Critique of Civilization isn't just that I'm ho holding up Homer as this bastion of the European or Western European civilization. It's that we're attentive in a critical theory sense to the ways that Homer's texts have been used to build the very identity category that we might associate with the West itself um, and with Western Europe. A um, couple of background things, and then I'll, I'll I'll make a little break, and then just and then dive into the text itself. Um, uh, the Odyssey um, is an example of epic poetry. Epic poetry is written in a narrative style and it uses the same verse meter throughout. So in Greek, this would be dactylic hexameter. Um, so six dactyls. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with prosody in these lectures, but a dactyl um, uh, is an accented followed by two unaccented syllables. Um, you can think of it, it kind of sounds like dancing, like da 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 right? Um, uh, in English, of course, I am, um, an a unaccented followed by an accented da 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 five I ams, da 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 pentameter, right? So five times. So dactylic hexameter in Greek um, is the way that uh, Homer's Odyssey would have been presented originally. Um, uh, in epic poetry, there's a narrative style, as I've said, um, and the action has no specific time span. And that's really going to be different than um, the poetry that we might associate with uh, Greek tragedy and drama, for example. So we can contrast epic poetry with lyric poetry as well, which often employs a first person perspective and deals with the themes of love or tragedy, for example, which was normally set in a more condensed time period, um, oftentimes around a single, even almost like 24 hour time period um, or just over. Um, uh, uh, so as we jump into um, this contextualized reading of Homer, 
I want you to try and think from the beginning of the narrator's style of storytelling. Um, it's useful to think of the stanzas as they're listed in the text, like camera angles. Um, so we have new technology from the 20th century and 21st century. Um, think about the ways that uh, um, the narrator might be doing cinematography uh, as we dive into the text here. Um, uh, um, it's so like I say, it's useful to think of the stanzas as like camera angles with also an extra diegetic narrator. So what's an extra diegetic narrator? This is the narrator like when you um, watch a documentary like a National Geographic or nature show and so there's no person that exists on the screen. You just hear this voice, this disembodied voice over. Um, uh, um, so think about the narrator of the Odyssey a little bit that way. We don't see the person doing the narrating in the field of readerly vision. Um, that doesn't mean that the narrator has no personality though. So we see that the writing in a lot of ways in this early book um, mimics the oral and the storyteller. Um, even the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight poem that I just read, the opening of gestures towards, oh, well, I heard this told in the city and this is, I'm, I'm doing a faithful retelling of that. So uh, uh, that, that the retelling and the narrative element um, are put together as well. Um, uh, and it has something to do with um, uh, a truth value, right? That I'm telling this in the way that it was originally told. Um, uh, so we can see that writing then in, the, in this text mimics the storyteller and we will see that the narrator gives special attention to the place of bards, for example, in the story. So that does give us a sense of the narrator's personality. Um, for ease of discussion, as I've already said, and because we know little about the supposed author Homer, who is likely a fiction composite of many, um, I'm going to call the narrator again Homer in these lectures. Normally we don't want to confuse the author with the narrator in the piece of literature, um, but I will do so frequently as I jump into what will now be contextualized readings, and I'm just going to go book by book in my lecture. Um, lectures. Um, uh, so a, a good way to do this class is for you to do your own reading first. Um, uh, think about it, take notes if you like, um, and then my lectures will give context and background and other ways to think through the text. I'm going to approach the lectures assuming that, that, that my readers don't have a, a really, really broad knowledge of Greek culture or Greek mythology. Um, that's just a teaching device that I will use um, and for a broad audience. Um, and and uh, um, so if you want to speed up or slow down, um, there will be moments where I'm talking about the text itself and how to understand the text. And then I'll pop out into these moments where I'm doing more of the work of critical or cultural theory or cultural poetics and, and really thinking about that question of what, what does Homer mean um, in current contexts and uh, especially with critiques around the Western civilization that in some ways we inherit, that in some ways we debate about to what extent it still exists or is relevant in our contemporary culture and to, um, of course, the ways that it remains present to current literary production and books like An Orchestra of Minorities, which is where we're heading through the summer. Thanks for listening to this opening lecture. I'm going to close this down and then pick up again um, with diving straight into Homer's Odyssey. Thanks for watching. Support us on Patreon if you can. Have a great day.